All right, thank you for the introduction. Uh, this has been a great session. I've really been excited by the papers and I'm hoping I'll uh, live up to the precedent already set. Uh, as was said, I am Adam Rule and I'm excited to present work that we've done looking at uh, how people use computational notebooks. And uh, Mary Beth already did just a great job introducing what they are and some of the challenges around them. And I won't be able to top that, but I can hopefully augment it a little bit with a story. And so I want to introduce you to this paper. This paper is called Growth in a Time of Debt. Uh, and it was published in 2010, and it's an economics paper that sought to answer uh, a rather simple but at the same time very complex question. How does government debt affect economic growth, uh, particularly post-recession uh, worldwide? Should governments be doing a lot of uh, debt-funded stimulus spending to get the economies going, or is this just going to be a disaster? And what the economists found was that countries that reached greater than 90% of their GDP and debt, they got debt up to that level, uh, averaged essentially stagnation or mild recession. This was terrible for the economy. Uh, and this paper has since been cited thousands of times. It's come up in discussions at the highest levels of government in the United States, in Europe, when making decisions about uh, what to do post-recession. Uh, the only problem is nobody could get the same figure. Uh, many groups tried to follow the steps listed in the paper, and they kept getting different numbers. And so finally, one group asked the original authors, can you just send us your analysis scripts? And upon receiving the Excel file used for this analysis, realized that if they added some omitted data, uh, changed the averaging method, and then fixed an error where the averaging function hadn't been drug all the way down the column, uh, they got a much different number of a rather healthy growth of 2.2%. Now, I think there's at least two lessons that we can pull from this. One is that small changes in how data are collected, cleaned, and analyzed can lead to drastically different results. And that secondly, when you separate the description of the analysis from the actual code or steps uh, or files used to perform the analysis, you can run into real challenges, either with auditing a result, replicating, or building on it. And it's for uh, those and other reasons that a number of people have switched over to using tools like the one Mary Beth spoke of, this being Jupyter Notebook, uh, to do data analysis in particular. Um, and throughout the talk, I'll be calling these computational notebooks. And at their core, what they do is they let analysts mix uh, code and visualizations that they can write interactively in line uh, with narrative text describing uh, what that code and those visualizations are doing. For example, in this one saying, oh, we need to plot what the data looks like first uh, before we can choose what model to use because if it's not a normally distributed data set, then we can't you know, use certain models. And what we wanted to know was something very similar to what Mary Beth was exploring, which was uh, how are people using these? In particular, are they using them to write these rich computational narratives like we hope they are, both to promote open science and, and greater flexibility in sharing? So we had three kind of sub-questions under this. How much narrative is in a typical computational notebook, specifically Jupyter notebooks? Uh, what about notebooks supplementing academic publications? Maybe these are different due to the different requirements of reproducibility in open science and academia. And then how do analysts think about and use the notebooks? And we actually ended up conducting three studies to look at this. First, pretty much scraping and analyzing all the Jupyter notebooks on GitHub. Second, hand coding a subselection of those that were academic notebooks, those supplementing academic publications. And finally, interviewing academic data analysts. And I think these methods uh, really augment Mary Beth Wells. Hers looking at uh, largely those in enterprise, ours in academia. Um, and the key takeaway that I want you to get from all of this, I'll just kind of produce it up front here, is uh, as was discussed before, there's this tension between exploring data and explaining process that hinders writing rich computational narratives. And I don't think this is unique just to computational notebooks. It's, it's all data analysis. Now let me walk you through kind of some of our evidence for why we think this is the case. And for the first study, we looked at Jupyter Notebooks on GitHub. And I just want to first note, there are now millions of these documents being shared publicly on GitHub. And GitHub has made it very easy to share there. Uh, you can see this exponential growth over the last couple of years. And when we did our analysis, there were just over a million notebooks that were on the platform publicly available for others to see. And we ended up essentially uh, searching for, scraping, and downloading all of these uh, for our first study. And then for each notebook, we computed a variety of features to describe the notebook. How many cells, that is, blocks of code or text are in the notebook? How many lines of code overall, words of text, function declarations? And there's a lot of this analysis I can't present today, but I'll just point you to, uh, we put a blog post up on the Jupyter blog describing both the work, linking to our own analysis notebooks, and to the full data set 
uh, if any of you are interested in looking at a million Jupyter notebooks and their content. Um, one of the most striking things for us in looking at this data was actually one of the simplest questions to form, which was really just how long are these notebooks, both in terms of text and lines of code. And I'm going to show you a couple plots here. Um, this first plot I'll point out on the uh, x-axis, I have the number of cells, kind of discrete units in the notebook. Uh, and this is a log plot, so you see it goes from 1, 10, 100. And then on the y-axis, I have the percent of all notebooks in our data set. So this is a histogram. And you'll notice a rather log normal plot uh, with a median of maybe around 20 cells uh, in the median notebook. Uh, if we look at this for the number of lines of code across the entire notebook, we get a similar plot. Again, rather log normal, median about 100 lines of code. But there's this little bump off to the left with about 3 or 4% of all notebooks having no code in them whatsoever. And these might be index notebooks that mainly contain links to other notebooks to guide you around a multi-notebook workspace. When we look at the number of words of text, though, in the notebooks, kind of that narrative description, we get a much different picture. There's still some of this log normal, but there's this really large bump off to the left. About 27% of all the notebooks that were publicly available on GitHub had no text whatsoever in them describing what was going on. And this was kind of our first hint that maybe these aren't being used for rich computational narrative like we might expect, at least in all cases. Now, a, a caveat to this. Um, many of these notebooks that we were looking at at GitHub seem to be for course assignments, particularly for students learning machine learning. Uh, as we looked at the keywords or the descriptions of the repositories that held these notebooks, some of the top words were like learning, machine, udacity, nano degree. And, and two things I want to note here. One, it may be that students in these courses aren't getting much training on using the notebook as a narrative vehicle and are essentially just focusing on the methods. Um, but secondly, uh, it may also be that uh, these students aren't really focused on sharing their work with others and not really wanting others or expecting others to replicate their work. And so we thought, well, maybe we're just looking at the wrong set of notebooks if we really want to get at ones that have rich narrative in them. What if instead we looked at academic notebooks? Uh, so looking at notebooks that were published online as a supplement to some academic publication. Maybe these will have more narrative as uh, we as academics want others to cite or understand or build on our work. So what we ended up doing is looking for notebooks that were published alongside academic publications. We looked at our GitHub data set and we looked for notebooks that were in repositories whose readme files linked to like a DOI link to a paper uh, or to an archive preprint. And then from there, we purposely sampled for notebooks that documented original research from a range of disciplines, biology, machine learning, astronomy. Uh, and in the end, we selected 145 notebooks that were documenting analyses for essentially uh, 50 different academic publications. And the first thing what I want to note is not all of these notebooks were achieving the same task or the same purpose. So we saw at least three distinct uses. Uh, first, these 54 first analysis notebooks are kind of what you might think of as the canonical notebook. They showed the entire analysis process from getting data, cleaning it, all the modeling to final discussion of results. However, there are these two other types, 41 tutorial notebooks, which rather than showing the full analysis would just show here's an example of a type of model that we did. Or here's how you can use the specific Python library that we developed for this kind of analysis. And then finally, there were 50 figure notebooks. And these wouldn't show the full analysis, but would just say, here's our clean data set, here's how to produce the figure. And it wasn't just to our eye that we saw these differences. If we look at the measures from study one of number of cells, lines of codes, words of text, we see differences here too. With these analysis notebooks having the, the most number of cells and words of text versus these figure notebooks, which had the least number of cells of words of text, but the most code dealing with those finicky details of getting the title and the, the plot right. So all this to say there are different uses of these notebooks. Now we wanted to dig deeper though with the smaller corpus and say, okay, not just uh, do these notebooks have text, but how are they using the text? Uh, so first we coded for do these notebooks have text at all? And we only see a slight improvement here with 77% of these notebooks having text in them describing the analysis. We then coded, okay, what is the text doing in these notebooks? Is it just describing the steps? We import data. We fit a linear model we plot something. Is it describing reasoning? We use this kind of model because of these assumptions. Or is it describing results? Here's how you should interpret what you're seeing here. And we what we found was a little surprising that while most of these notebooks that had text, 88% uh, of them described the steps of what were going on, very few, just around a third, went to kind of this higher level of narrative, talking about intentions, motivations, the reasoning that went into place and the results. 
So to get a better understanding of why this is the case, why there's not really rich narrative, even in these academic notebooks, uh, we interviewed some academic analysts. So we found 15 academic data analysts working in a variety of labs on our campus, doing things from computational biology, uh, pharmacology, astronomy, engineering. And we asked them just to discuss with us their use and their sharing of notebooks. So things like, can you show us a notebook you've worked on recently? Can you explain the analysis going on in this notebook? Or who else has access to this? And there's a couple things that we noted here. First, many of the analysts felt their notebooks were personal. Either they reflected a personal programming style or that it wouldn't be very useful if they shared it to somebody else. So one participant said, a notebook is a very personal thing. So even if I would say, okay, here, lab mate, please look into it, it would be, wouldn't be very helpful because it's very much reflecting my style. And for sure, he would do slightly different types of analysis to come to the same conclusions. Now, related to this is a finding that Mary Beth has found and Stuart Geiger and others who've looked into this is that people felt that their notebooks were just inherently messy. Due to the iterative nature of data analysis, they just had messy notebooks. So one participant said, mine feels like a mess. Mine feels like if somebody else looked at it, they wouldn't have any idea what really, what order I ran the code in or why I did things. And this was reflected with every single participant we talked to. Uh, others just simply said it's messy, uh, this is not how I strive for them to be, that their notebooks had ugly code, or my favorite, that they contained dirty tricks uh, that they had to get rid of before they shared the notebook with someone else. Now, while these notebooks seemed messy, some people did put in the effort to clean them up, again, as Mary Beth talked about. Uh, but it was often a tedious process and done for one of two broad reasons. One reason is for your own personal benefit. So, for example, one analyst uh, had many collaborators who were constantly sending him questions. Hey, could you ask this or that of the data? So he would put those questions into the notebook as headings for the different sections he was working on. And that would help him navigate the notebook if someone said, hey, did you, did you follow up on that thing? So he said, so I try to document what I'm doing, or at least what the tasks are, because it's so easy to get lost in all the different specific questions. Now, another participant that we had was mainly thinking about organizing notebooks for others. She worked in more of a consultant role, where other labs would send her data, she would do the analysis, and then present back results. And she said, the thing that I usually end up having to put in that's tedious, but it's kind of the whole point, is what are the conclusions that I drew? Not just this is the visualization, but if you look at this visualization, the conclusion that you should draw is the interpretation. That's not something that can ever be auto-generated. Now, we've talked about messy notebooks and tediously organizing them. And I think this, this last point that I'm going to show gets at why is it that people aren't going and organizing their notebooks more? And uh, that's kind of a lack of reflective practice in the exploration process itself. As one participant said, it's mostly lab meetings than actually writing the paper that are the only times, or maybe initial planning, that are the only times where you have to sit and be like, why am I doing this? What am I going to do? What am I finding? What do I think it means? Now, in summary, as I get to the end, I don't want you to come away thinking that, oh, we're just down on computational notebooks. Uh, it's quite the opposite. They address some of the core challenges of performing, documenting, and sharing data analysis. And I think they're a great tool for promoting open science. That said, we notice this tension between exploration and explanation, between the iterative processes that lead to messy notebooks and the more reflective ones that lead to what some call GitHub-ready notebooks, these portfolio pieces that you can share with others. And then, again, a summary that most notebooks have little in the way of narrative, either because they lack narrative text altogether or that text isn't being used to richly describe the analysis. But we think social or technical interventions may be able to help. So, for example, in discussing this with Fernando Perez, one of the, the co-creators of Jupyter Notebook, he mentioned, well, one of the things we really had to think about is what's the default cell type we want? Right now, the default cell when you create a new cell is a code cell, and that kind of biases you towards just continuing the analysis. What if we simply flip that to the default cell type being text? That by default, when you add a new cell, you're prompted to add a description of what you're going to do next. Or more social interventions. One of the participants we had discussed how her computational notebook was different from how she had been trained with uh, her biology or chemistry courses. That when she was first taking those courses, she was entrained in a very specific way of documenting her work putting her name here and all the steps in this way so that others can read and understand that. I mean, there wasn't a similar training or practice when using computational notebooks. Uh, so again, our final takeaway, that there's this tension between exploring data and explaining process that hinders writing rich computational narratives. And I don't think this is just for computational notebooks. I think it extends to data analysis, both in just programmatic data analysis, but in its other forms. 
uh, and we can maybe begin to discuss that. So I'll thank you all for listening and open up the floor for questions. Hi, Adam. Hi. Um, so your slide about what types of text that you hand coded, um, I'm interested in what the steps actually meant. I mean, was that actually, I went down these dead ends and I rejected them because, or was it just to get here, I do step A, step B, step C, step D? Yeah, often the latter. And often it would be this header of like, import data. And then they do several steps for that. And uh, fit model, you know, very helpful descriptions. Just yeah. so, so did you find any people talking about the exploration that they did and why they went down one path, why they came back, why they... Yeah, yeah, a couple cases would do something like that. Either saying, you know, we tried this model and it wasn't very helpful. Uh, often the folks who did that most is when they were playing with parameters. And, you know, I need to set parameters for a model. And we explored using, you know, 10, 100, 1,000, you know, different orders of magnitude. And this parameter set gave us the most robust model. But they wouldn't show all those steps. They just mention it in text. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Wendy Mackay, INRIA. Uh, really nice work. like it very much. Um, I find it interesting, having done some work with, um, actually, one of your co-authors there, um, on uh, physical notebooks and looking at how people at the Institut Pasteur and several other places write personal notebooks. And what they often do is they have a scratch notebook on the side, as well as the official one that they know is going to be archival. And the archival notebook has comments in it and things that are sort of results and ideas, but not in an informal way. It's a very, they, they sit down and they set aside time and they have their markers and they have their things and they once a week or once every two or three days, they put together the notebook. And that's a fundamentally different thing. And I wonder if by mixing electronic notebooks so that it's all electronic, if you lose that sort of disciplined exercise of reflecting on your work for the past two days or week and saying what you're thinking about it, if that isn't actually kind of causing a problem for people and is there a solution that would allow people to follow that discipline? And yeah. Let's get this. No, I think that's fascinating. I mean, on a number of levels. One, uh, just the nature of using electronic media and the ability to jump around and be distracted by a number of things if the the being able to use a physical media where that's less of a, uh, a temptation leads to more reflective practice. Mm -hmm. uh, also just the social intervention of, uh, it may be that the things that lead to greater narrative most are not technical things that we do, but labs setting up social norms of, yes. this is just how things are done. Or mm -hmm. uh, when you come to the weekly lab meeting, your notebooks need to be in this state. Uh, and then finally, uh, I wonder about uh, if there's interventions we can do that are kind of post hoc like that, after the fact, you can go through and organize. Uh, the relative effectiveness of those versus ones that are more in situ, in the moment. Uh, and, and I don't have an answer to that, but I think it's worth exploring. Future research. Thank you for a great talk. Um, you're, you're, you opened with talking about the, you know, the, the famous Excel error, right? Because the, the, they hadn't shown their work in the form of the 15-page paper. And midway through, you talked about um, the consultant, right, who had given very clear descriptions, but because that's what she was paid to do. Um, I was wanting to bring this back to the academic context. Do you know of, uh, of, of, of any groups that allow the submission of papers in the form of these notebooks as opposed to the more standard 15 page you know, uh, uh, text submissions? Yeah, great question. And here I'd have to say, you know, folks in library science have done much more investigation into um, different ways of publishing for academia and using notebooks as well as citing and how to have citation of notebooks or those kind of things. I personally am not aware of any top level venues uh, that are that way, but um, I wouldn't, you know, stand too firmly on that. There, there may be some. Yeah. Cool. Thanks so much. Thanks.